your Bibles open to Romans chapter 1. Last week, we looked a little bit at Romans chapter 1, verses 18, talking about the wrath of God, and we're going to continue with that this morning. Let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became what? Fools. Oh. Oh. Here's a little secret about the writings of Paul. <clears throat> Paul's method of writing is often he will make a statement. You need to look for those statements because once he has made a statement, he will try to expound on it, or he will explain it, or he will defend it. So the statement of our passage today is verse 18. And the rest of the chapter, verses 19 through 32, is simply expounding on what he says in verse 18. So we need to understand the statement first, before we can understand what he's trying to explain. What does he say in verse 18? He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That's the statement. He begins with the wrath of God. Whenever we read that statement, wrath of God, it sometimes makes our knees shake. So let me explain the word. When the Bible talks of God's wrath, we must not equate it with human wrath. It is not some emotional anger or a loss of self-control where God lashes out on those who are against Him. That is not the biblical definition of wrath. In fact, this passage is one of the finest definitions of God's wrath found in Scripture. A lot of people reading the Old Testament, and I have heard many people say this, a lot of people reading the Old Testament think of God as a God of wrath, ready to bring fire down upon the human race or those who sin. But I would like to explain that God's wrath is not like man's wrath. Man's wrath and God's wrath, as I said, are not the same, so we must never try to understand the wrath of God by our understanding of human wrath. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll explain to our look at that a little bit deeper. You see, there is one sin that God cannot forgive. And that sin is the sin of unbelief. If you reject the gift of God, then there is no way that God can save you. So his wrath is against ungodliness. Do you guys understand that? God's wrath is against ungodliness because ungodliness is unbelief. And if you fall into ungodliness, there is nothing more that God can do to save you. That is a choice that you make. And this is what Paul is bringing out here in this section of the book of Romans. I've looked at this over and over and over and over and over probably three or four more overs even. And Paul was a brilliant man. Paul would have been a great prosecutor. Prosecutor. Is that word? Prosecutor. 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 That word. He would have made a great prosecutor. Okay? Paul, when you get into chapter 2, he's laid everything out here in verse 1, or in chapter 1, and he starts to make a case, and he lays it out even more in chapter 2. And when we get there, he's going to make this distinction. And I always thought, they must have left something out there. Because why does he go from this thought, boom, right into this thought? That never made sense to me. Until I started studying it more. And we're going to get to that. And, and you'll see just how brilliant this man Paul is. And he leaves nothing out. When God inspired him, uh, what we've been learning in a Sabbath school class, is when God picks Saul, turned him to Paul, he made the right choice. Because Paul was the right man for the job that God had given him. Paul was brilliant. Just a brilliant man. And it still just amazes me 
at how he put these things together. So, his wrath is against ungodliness because he loves you. He doesn't want you or I to be lost. And we will see this more and more as we go along. So in summary, the wrath of God is his hatred for sin, and he hates sin because he loves us. God's love is hatred for unrighteousness because he knows that the moment you reject him, you have rejected life. And he doesn't want that. He hates ungodliness because he cannot save us by or in our ungodliness. So having said that, I want you to look at the next thing that is extremely important in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So God's wrath, said Paul, has been revealed against two things. The first is ungodliness, and the second is unrighteousness for the wickedness of men. Now, do you think that Paul put that in that order on purpose? Yes. Think about this. Okay? We talked about this a little bit last week. Unrighteousness is the fruit of ungodliness. It's a symptom. The biggest problem in our world today is ungodliness. And this is what the world needs for healing, for reconciliation, and for all the ills that is, we deal with on a day to day basis. Because without godliness, there can be no righteousness. Without righteousness, there can be no peace. Amen? Amen. So I want to emphasize the order in which the Apostle points his finger at man's problem. You will notice that he puts ungodliness first. Then in his thinking, unrighteousness follows. To him, the big thing, the important thing, is ungodliness. Now this is important for us to realize, especially today, because the modern approach is that man's real problem is unrighteousness. We read about the terrible things that are taking place in our country and in our world, and we say that man's problem is unrighteousness. And ungodliness is hardly ever mentioned. But as I said, unrighteousness is the consequence. Unrighteousness is the fruit of ungodliness. So the problem is ungodliness. When man turns his back to God, that results in unrighteousness. I want to backtrack a little bit right now. And I want to go to the first part of Romans, chapter 1. And let's look at this. Paul starts by saying who he is. He says, Paul. What's that next word? A bondservant. We've been studying this in the Sabbath school class. What does that word bondservant mean? He's a slave of Jesus Christ. Is this important? Is this important for you and I to know? Why? Because there's only two powers in this entire universe. There's the power of God, and there's the power of Satan. And you're going to give your allegiance to one or the other. And you do that on a day-to-day -day basis by the decisions and the choices that you make. It is about your will. There is no fence sitting with God. You're either in His camp, and you're a slave to Him, or you're in the devil's camp, and you're a slave to Him. So who would you rather be a slave to? God or the devil? It's not really that hard of a decision to make. We found that out in our Sabbath school class, right? So Paul says plainly that he's a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, what Holy Scriptures did Paul have to use when he was defending the gospel? Again, we study this in our Sabbath school class. So when you look at these first set of verses of Romans, what you're finding here is that there's no such thing as dispensationalists. That this way we are saved today is the same way they were saved in Paul's day, was the same way they were saved in Moses' day, was the same way they were saved in Noah's day, was the same way they were saved in Adam's day. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's one gospel. The problem is, the church today doesn't know what that gospel is. That's, that's a sad statement. But God in His mercy and God in His grace has given us all that we need to know what 
the gospel of Jesus Christ is. And you will find it contained in the book of Galatians that if you come to the Sabbath school class, you will hear some really good lessons on the book of Galatians and also in the book of Romans. And that's why we're going over this now. So as we continue on, verse 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by what? Don't you think that's a strange phrase right there? He's declared to be the Son of God by power of the resurrection from the dead. Why did he put it in there like that? Any ideas? If there was no, if he, there was no resurrection, there was no hope for us either. If he couldn't conquer death, he couldn't conquer sin. If he couldn't conquer sin, how could we ever conquer sin? And what is the wages of sin? Yeah. So you see that whole circle there? What is our problem? Our problem is we are born with a fallen, sinful nature that is rebellious against God. The wages of sin is? But the gift of God is? Through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Through Him, we have received grace. I love that word. And apostleship. For here's a, another word that people don't like to hear today. What's that word? <laughs> through Him, that's through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name. Now, let me ask you this question. In the way this is structured, is it just Paul and the other apostles who have received this obedience to the faith? No. Or is it to all of us who believe? Okay? So it is to all of us who believe on the name of Jesus Christ. What's been given to us? The ability to have obedience in this faith. What does that word obedience actually mean? Submitting Any ideas there? Come on, you went over it in South School class. Submitting to the will. Okay? Now listen. Through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you do not have to be a slave to your sinful nature. It does not have to control you. That through the power of Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, God now dwells within you, and if God is in you and God is for you, then who can be against you? Amen. Amen. The who that can be against you is talking about Satan and his power. Two powers. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve the devil. But how do we, in this sinful nature, serve a holy and righteous God? Outside or, or in and of myself, I cannot do that. I can't accomplish that. And that is my problem, and that is the whole human dilemma. And God has the answer for that problem and that dilemma, and that answer is Jesus Christ and the gospel. Amen? Amen. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome. I used to blow over these parts of the text because you're just thinking he was making nice, you know what I'm saying? But as I'm learning in the Sabbath school class, that... Paul was inspired to write all of this, and he was inspired to write it through the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yeah. So this next part of this verse is addressed to you and I. <laughs> now, do you guys remember Daniel? Yeah. Do you remember that Daniel was called by the angel the beloved of God? The one loved by God? <clears throat> do you ever wish that God would say the same thing to you? Amen. Yeah. I have actually said that like just a couple of days ago. I read something that brought my attention to the last part of this verse. Now let's read that. Verse 7, to all who are in Rome, you could change Rome to New Smyrna Beach. To all who are in New Smyrna Beach. What's that next word? Beloved, Beloved of God, called saints. That's you. That's I. You're beloved of God. Do you know why you're beloved of God? It's not because of what you do. Not because of how you act. It's because God 
loves you with an everlasting, eternal love, and He gave His Son so that you do not have to perish in your sin. Amen. And God loved you so much, you don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. Amen. Do you realize that the highest level of freedom is found in slavery to Jesus Christ? That's the great paradox of the Gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many of you guys, when you were teenagers, said to your parents, or your friend, I just can't wait to be free. <laughs> right? Do you remember that? I can't wait to be free. I'm tired of everybody telling me what to do. How many of you adults here think that in your mind when you're dealing with your boss at work? I'm tired of everybody telling me what to do. I can't wait to be free. But let me ask you guys, who are 60 and above, has there ever been a time in your life when you got to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want? It's not the way life is, right? And as you become an adult, you start to realize what responsibility and maturity really is and that God has called you to submit, right? The Bible tells slaves to submit to their masters. In our day, that would be to submit to your bosses, whether they're good to you or bad to you. It's about submitting. But what you find in Jesus Christ is the highest liberty the highest and truest freedom that we can ever experience is being a slave to Jesus Christ. Because if I'm a slave to Christ, I'm no longer a slave to this flesh. Amen. Let me read this to you. When Paul uses the word the gospel of God, the apostle declared that he was separated unto the gospel of God. It is the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ. Christ is God, and therefore the gospel of God of which the apostle speaks in the first verse of the chapter is identical with the gospel of Christ of which he speaks in the 16th verse. Too many people separate the Father and the Son in the work of the gospel. Many do so unconsciously. God the Father, as well as the Son, is our Savior. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to John 3.16. You know this verse, but let's read it. John 3.16. God the Father, as well as the Son, is our Savior. John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have life. Now, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's look at verse 19. Second Corinthians 5, verse 19. It says what? God? Well, hold on. Your page is turned. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. Let's read this together. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. So God so loved the world that he gave us his son, and that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Okay? The counsel of peace is between them both. Zechariah 6, 13. Christ came to the earth only as the representative of the Father. Whoever saw Christ saw the Father. The works which, which Christ did were the works of the Father who dwelt in him. Even the words which he spoke were the words of the Father. That's John chapter 14, verses 9, 10, and finally verse 24. When we hear Christ saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, now will give you rest. We are listening to the gracious invitation of God the Father. When we see Christ taking the little children up in his arms and blessing them, we are witnessing the tenderness of the Father. When we see Christ receiving sinners, mingling with them and eating with them, forgiving their sins and cleansing the hideous lepers with a touch, we are looking upon the condensation and compassion of the Father. Even when we see our Lord upon the cross, with the blood streaming from his side, that blood by which we are reconciled to God, we must not forget that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, so that the Apostle Paul said, 
the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. That's Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I grew up, and when I became an Adventist, for many years, I still couldn't fathom the Father actually loving me. I always thought that he was the stern one. I didn't need to realize I grew up in the Catholic faith. And that in that faith, you needed a lot of different people to get you into the presence of both Jesus and the Father. And with that background, <laughs> it was kind of like the good cop, bad cop thing. Jesus loved you, protected you from the wrath of the Father, that when you did something wrong, he was there to actually punish you. And it took a long time to start to understand that truly when you saw how Christ treated people, what you're seeing is a clear expression of the Father. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. And how much Jesus loves you is how much God the Father loves you. And if you got both of them that loves you, how much you think the Holy Spirit loves you? If all three of the God that loves you, what else do you need? What other power do you need in your life? So, as we continue on, what then is God's wrath? God's wrath is his hatred for sin. We always need to remember that God hates sin. So why does God hate sin? It leads to death. Say it loud, Ricky. It leads to death. Do you understand? Is our God a God of life or a God of death? Life. Do you understand the whole ideology of Eastern religion and mysticism, that whole yin and yang thing? You got the white little fishy thing and the dark little fishy thing, and they make a complete circle. Do you guys understand what that means? That means that in the divine, you need both light and darkness. You need both good and evil, and it keeps balance within the universe. That's the biggest bunch of hokey I've ever heard in my life. And I studied it for years. And the reason why it's hokey is because when you come to know God, the true God, you find out there is no darkness or shadow of turning in Him. That our God is a God of light, a God of love, and a God of life. We do not serve a God of death, we serve a God of life. Sin leads to death, which is why God hates sin. Because it's the exact opposite of who and what he is and stands for. So God hates sin. The difference between us and God is that God hates sin and God loves a sinner. Personally, myself, I have trouble sometimes hating the sin and loving the sinner. I hate the sin and the sinner. <laughs> Sometimes they, they may not even be a sinner, I just don't like them. That's the flesh. And this is what Christ came to change in me. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, He has. It's not an easy change. And, and it's not a pain free change. Actually, truthfully, it's a very painful change. Because what I found is that I can deceive myself fairly easily. And I can justify almost anything I want to do, or think, or say. But when I look at Christ, and I look at that cross, and I see Him hanging there, and realize He was innocent. He who knew no sin became me. Not you, me. My sin. I'm the guilty one. I put him up there, and he did it willingly because he loved me. And Patty, he did it because he loves you. And that every darkness and evil that is inside of me, he took all that. And what he places inside me is a new heart, a new mind, and the power to use my will to follow him and to submit to Him, and to reflect His character. And that, brothers and sisters, is one of the greatest things 
that I have ever experienced in this life. Okay? Okay? okay. that same question when we've lost loved ones. Because he loves me. Let me ask you a question. I'm good. That's okay. And, and that's a good question that you're asking. Because I guarantee you that every adult in this room has asked that same question. I'm confused. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever burnt your finger? Yeah. Did God make you burn your finger? No. Why? Because I knew it would hurt. But did God make you burn your finger? Or did you choose to put your finger somewhere where it's hot? I did. Okay, so in this life, we live, we experience pleasure, we experience pain, and if we live long enough, we will die. Why? Because we get sick, we get diseases, we get into accidents. Does God cause that? No, it's... So God didn't take your father. Your father was just, he lived out the natural course of his life. If Jesus doesn't come back, at some point you will be in that same situation. You will get old, you will get sick, and if Jesus doesn't come back, you will die. All of us here will do that. Is that right? Is it God who takes our loved ones? Is it God who causes the diseases? Now, this is the dilemma. Is our God all-powerful? Yes. Can our God stop all this stuff? Yes. Does He choose to? No. And you have to submit to that. Yes. Not right? yet, anyway. He's right. going to do it very soon, I think. So listen. <laughs> this is where faith comes in. And this is where trust in God comes in. Amen. Because when we know God, then we can be like, let's take the example of Daniel. Remember the story of Daniel and the lion's den? That Daniel, because he loved God so much, that Daniel three times a day would go up into his room and he would pray. And so the people that didn't like Daniel decided that they were going to try to get him killed. They made this decree and they flattered the king. And the king signed this decree. You remember what the decree said? said that nobody can pray to a man or a god unless they pray to the king. And anybody found praying to anybody but the king will what? Be thrown into the den of lions. Now, do you think Daniel knew about this decree? And did he go up at that same time every day after he learned about this decree? Yes. And did he pray? Yes. Why? Because he understood kind of that God is love. And that we live in a wicked, sinful world. And that there is a devil who the Bible tells us goes about as a roaring lion, seeking to destroy and devour all that he can. But Daniel, who loved God, went up there to pray because he didn't care what was going to happen to him. Why? Because he trusted God. And Kylo, that's what you and I have to do when we don't understand why our loved ones die why tragedy happens in our lives, why we lose this job, why we don't hear God's voice when we're crying out to Him. <clears throat> Daniel had three friends. Their names were what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had a test just like Daniel did. Their test was they were to bow down at the image that the king made. And if they didn't bow down, what was going to happen to them? Now, you've heard this before. Don't you think it would just been convenient to look down and realize that your uh, sandal was untied? Just at that moment, just bend down? No, because they stood for principle. They loved their God, and they realized that if they bowed down, then they were denying the faith in their God. And not even death 
was worth more than their relationship with their God. And that's what God is calling you and I to today right now, Kyle. To have that kind of faith. To trust Him, to love Him, and to be faithful to Him. To accept that when our loved ones die, God didn't do that on purpose. God doesn't do that to hurt us. That's just a natural part of this.